Hey, it's Mike Hambright with Flipner.com. Welcome back for another exciting VIP interview where I interview some of the most successful and interesting real estate investing experts and entrepreneur in the industry to help you learn and grow. Today, I'm joined by John Heyer, who's an active real estate investor himself, but a tax attorney and accountant by trade focused purely on real estate investing. All of his clients are real estate investors, so you're going to learn a lot today. So taxes and accounting and bookkeeping is an area that most real estate investors love to hate, but I can tell you from personal experience, being strategic from a tax perspective can help put a lot more money in your pocket and help you avoid some massive headaches down the road. Today, we're going to pack this interview with all kinds of stuff. We're going to talk about choosing the right legal entities for your business, building wealth in your IRA, because John does a lot of IRA work, and we're going to talk about bookkeeping, an area that real estate investors generally hate, but John is going to give us maybe some tips on how to make it a little bit easier for us. Before we get started, though, let's take a moment to recognize our featured sponsors. RealtyMogul.com is an online marketplace for real estate investing, connecting borrowers and capital from accredited and institutional investors. Get a rehab loan fast and close in as little as 10 days. Rates start as low as 9%. We'd also like to thank National Real Estate Insurance Group, the nation's leading provider of insurance to the residential real estate investor market. From individual properties to large-scale investors, National Real Estate Insurance Group is ready to serve you. Please note, the views and opinions expressed by the individuals in this program do not necessarily reflect those of FlipNerd.com or any of its partners, advertisers, or affiliates. Please consult professionals before making any investment or tax decisions, as real estate investing can be risky. Hey, John. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to pack this interview today full of, uh, of great content, right? Hey, I'm not billing, so take advantage. Hit it while oh, you Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah, I forgot to ask you if we were on the clock, so I'm glad we're not. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, um, before we get started, we're going to talk about some stuff uh, here, IRAs, choosing legal entities, which is always an interesting question. Everybody always asks that, and a lot of times it's hard to get a solid answer maybe out of an attorney, so I know you've got some answers for us, though and uh, building wealth in your IRA, a whole bunch of stuff. Before we get started, though, why don't you introduce yourself and tell everybody a little bit about you? Sure. Uh, my name is John Heyer. I'm a lawyer and accountant. All my clients are real estate investors, and we get a lot of the sort of exotic clients that are doing something a little different. So we're very used to dealing with subject to lease options, assignments, buying partial, selling partial, selling notes, buying notes at a discount, you name it. Whatever technique out there that most people would consider different or exotic, We've probably seen it and dealt with it. And we do both the accounting side, uh, particularly the tax returns, and we also do a lot of planning. And if you need it, we hope you don't, but if you need it, audit representation or collection representation. Uh, so small firm in Ohio, nationwide client base, mainly because our expertise is so rare. It's hard. I mean, you know, a lot of people end up paying their accountant to learn from them. You've, not, you know, you've never lived until you've watched somebody pay an accountant for three hours to sit and explain how certain types of deals work. Yeah, and We've never had to have that with clients. It's usually about a five minute process. I've usually heard of it and if I haven't, I can research it and figure it out. Yeah, yeah, that's great, that's great. Um, well, why don't we start with choosing the right legal entity? So it's a question that every investor asks. In fact, I, I uh, mentor and coach a lot of new real estate investors that come into the industry and they, that's always one of the first questions they ask is, should I set up an LLC or an S-Corp or what's the right legal entity? And I usually just dodge that question a little bit and say, you, you know, here's a couple of attorneys you can talk to. Um, and uh, I know historically, what's interesting because you're an accountant and an attorney, historically my accountant has always said something different from my attorney yeah. because they're looking at it from how to minimize taxes and the attorney is looking at it from how to uh, how to kind of minimize uh, legal liability. So, so what are your thoughts on what the right legal entity is for a real estate investor? It's funny. The lawyers always tell you, go talk to your tax guy. And the tax guy says, always go talk to your lawyer. And as you said, they agree. Fortunately, if I disagreed on film, it would be, and disagreed with myself, it could be really amusing, help send me to a shrink. So we try to synthesize the ideas. Let me give you some guidelines. Let me give you the usual lawyer caveat of this isn't legal advice. You really should talk to someone about your circumstances. But these are some really useful guidelines to incorporate. When it comes to buying and selling, I call flipping generically a number of things. For me, assigning is flipping, retail deals where you rehab them is flipping, and wholesale deals where you take title and then sell it off quickly is flipping. So for me, those three things are pretty much the same. What are we looking at? 
um, if you're not taking title, you probably have a social security tax issue right away or self-employment tax. It's the same thing. So if you're flipping, if, or I'm sorry, if you're assigning, it's an issue right away because the IRS looks at that as services income and you pay that extra 15% on that. So we want to minimize the tax. If you're actually taking title, we've got the famous dealer issue. Whenever you're considered a dealer, that's when you pay the self-employment social security tax. So with people who take title, the first few deals they do, we can often put them on Schedule D as in dog, treat them as a short-term capital gain, and there's no social security tax on that. But you can only do that for so long because what the IRS looks for is a pattern. So once you've got a pattern of buying and selling, or if you're doing assignments at all, because it's a little bit different technique, you've got a social security issue. So how do you minimize that? There are two, there are two primary ways to minimize it. A, you convert social security taxable income into non-social security taxable income. So I'll give you an example, classic for my business. I have a service business, right? We do tax advising and lawyering for a living, just like you're flipping. It's the same kind of income. Yeah. That is taxable for social security tax. What do we do? How do we convert it into non-taxable income? Well, I might buy a building and rent it to my tax practice. Well, rental income is not social security taxable. So let's say I'm paying two grand a month from my lawyer company or my flipping company in your case to my rental company. That's converting two grand a month to non-social security taxable because my, my income on my flip side goes down two grand a month. My rental income goes up two grand a month. So income tax wise, it evens out. But social security tax wise, this is not taxable here. Now, John, when you say social security taxable, are, are you referring to with entities that are passed through entities? Yeah, the, the default is if, if you have no entity, you pay self-employment or social security tax. If you have a regular LLC that makes no election, you pay social security or self-employment tax. And there are certain types of entities that limit that. So we're going to get into that next. So okay, technique okay. one is you convert uh, social security taxable income into not. And it usually involves paying an outside company that you own. Another example would be debt. You fund a company with debt. Maybe the interest rate's on the high side, you know, more towards 12% or something. Well, that's a deduction for my company that's flipping. It's income for interest, but interest is not Social Security tax. So that's rule one. Rule two is choice of entity. There are three types of entities that can help protect you from Social Well, I lied. I'm a lawyer. It's what I do. Really, four types of entities that can help protect you from Social Security tax. So which one do you use? I have to know a lot more about you, but I can give you some guidelines. For newbies, we usually use an LLC that is taxed like an S corporation. So when you set it up with the state, it's an LLC, but then you tell the IRS on a special form, we want you to pretend that that's an S corporation, and they will. Now what's nice about an S corporation is the income that passes through the S is not taxed for Social Security purposes. but the IRS requires you to pay a reasonable salary. We, we, we're going to debate what's reasonable. But they want a reasonable salary. That salary, you do pay Social Security tax on. So our goal is to keep the salary as small as possible. The IRS's goal is to argue for the biggest salary possible. And it's a subjective thing. It's like, what's a house worth? Well, you know, it depends. Am I buying or selling? I'm going to give you two different numbers. Right. There's there's a subjective range. Even an appraiser will sometimes give you a range of here's what it's worth. Sure. Same thing with the salary. So our goal when we do planning is to figure out what is the smallest salary we reasonably think we can get away with, such that if we get audited, maybe the IRS will take it and maybe they won't. But if they impose a different number, at least we don't pay penalties. That's our mm -hmm. goal. And that's huge because the Social Security tax is 15% up to the first 110000 of of flipping income. After that, right. the bracket actually goes down. Right. Now, the S corporations have an advantage. They're cheap and easy to set up. They have a disadvantage. They get audited hard. The IRS is all over them. They know this technique. They know why you set up an S corp, and they audit aggressively. So what we say for newbies, maybe in the beginning when you're new, you don't want to spend a whole ton of money on entities. For example, all this stuff about setting up an entity in Nevada, if we have time, we'll talk about it. For newbies, big waste of time and money. They should be spending their money on marketing and on education and getting deals, not on having 15 entities in Nevada or Wyoming. Right. Um, but we like LLCs taxed as S-Corps because they're simple. 
but high audit percentage. Once you start to get a little bigger, once you start to get a little more sophisticated, or once you have a partner that's not your spouse, because the other disadvantage of an S Corp is that they're not real flexible. Mm -hmm. So if you have a partner in an S Corp and anything changes, it can be a problem. S corporations are just not flexible. So what we try and do then is if you start off with a partner that's not your spouse, or as you get larger and being audited becomes much more of a concern, we tend to go in one of several directions. It kind of depends on the client. We like limited partnerships. They have the same law as S corporations. In other words, they, they have the same social security tax advantage, but they're not audited nearly as much. They're mm -hmm. audited far less and they're specifically audited on the social security tax issue a lot less. What's the downside? More complicated. Right? If you set up a limited partnership, you have to have an entity that's a general partner. So you've got two entities you're really dealing with. The law for limited partnerships is more complex, more old fashioned than LLCs. Because remember, I suggested before an LLC tax does an S Corp. An LLC law is pretty simple in a lot of ways. Yeah. So we're dealing with more complexity, more moving parts. And that's the trade-off. You get more flexibility, less likelihood of an audit. Sometimes, and this is fairly new, we suggest an LLC with partners. There's some really gray law that says LLCs with partners may not have to pay self-employment tax, but it's very, very gray law. Hmm. We like it more than the LP because it's simpler. LLCs are simpler and easier to run than limited partnerships, but it gets you the same benefit, lower chance of an audit and way more flexibility. Last but not least, entity number four, C corporations. When do we use those? Most of the time we find that C corporations are grossly oversold. We see a lot of people set them up and they either don't get any use out of them, they just sit and they pay the fees, yeah. or they actually get hammered. They don't use them right because the accountant gave a boom type of recommendation instead of looking at their circumstances, looking at their books and records, their returns, but also forward where they want to go. So playing a little bit Miss Cleo, trying to see where they think the future is going to go and, and trying to make it fit for what the client's going to do. I'll tell you, the C-Corps make the most sense when we're dealing with high bracket people. The number one benefit of a C-Corporation is that the first $50,000, 50K, is taxed at 15, 1,5%. Right. Well, if you're in a 35% bracket, 20% on 50 grand a year savings, that's 10 grand a year in net savings. Right. But you always remember that the C Corp almost invariably is a satellite, never the main business. So I probably have my big flipping business here that makes the money and is getting me into that high bracket. And then maybe I take this little C Corp moon that revolves around my entity and we throw a few deals to it, enough to get it up to that 50,000 bucks a year. Hmm. Maybe enough to get a few of the C corporation perks, but again, the C corporation perks that you hear all the promoters talk about, those are grossly oversold and overdone. Okay. I'll, give you, I'll give you one example that really just lights my fuse. They say that um, if you have a C corporation, you can deduct up to fifty thousand dollars of term life insurance. Well, it sounds great, except how much does fifty grand of term life cost you? Maybe a hundred bucks a year, maybe. Right. Right. It's, it's a silly deduction. Why would I even consider a $100 deduction when deciding if I'm going to have a separate entity? It's immaterial and irrelevant, but it sounds good when we're marketing. Yeah. So a lot of sizzle, no steak. So very fast talking. I hope everybody understood what I said because I accelerated to get the answer in. Because I don't like to just give an answer. I want you to have a, an understanding of why. Because you see all this stuff on the Internet of which entity to use. And people are like, well, who do we listen to? We don't know. Well, right. The guy who tells you why and why not and tries to explain it so you get it. Right, right. Yeah. And I think, like you said, it's a case-by-case -case basis, largely depending on if you have partners, what type of business you're going to operate and things like that. So I think the key is just to either talk to you or talk to a professional that knows what they're doing. You know, it's usually a quick discussion for us. Unless you've got some seriously large business already existing, it's usually for a newbie an hour-long conversation of which entities should we use. Maybe two hours. Just depends on how organized they are and how much they got going on. Now, if it's a little more substantial, you're still only looking at three to four hours. It's not a lot of time to spend to make a very fundamental business decision because we've seen people pick the wrong entity, and it's a nightmare. Yeah, you can regret that for sure. Right. Well, okay, John, that's awesome. That's great information. So, talk a little bit about. Um 
Uh, we'll go next into the bookkeeping stuff. Just some of the um, some tips there. I mean, I know bookkeeping is. I know. I mean, I know a lot of real estate investors, and they do some terrible things. Like they, you know, just have a box full of receipts sitting somewhere, or you know, they they do their uh, bookkeeping once a quarter or something like that, which would be a nightmare. Um, we've hired that out. We have a bookkeeper that's, that's on our staff just because we don't like to do it. I mean, it's, it's just one of those things that's a necessary evil, but if you don't keep your books clean, it is, it can become a, a nightmare. I know that. So talk a little bit about some of the mistakes you see and give some advice on how to keep cleaner books for real estate investors. Yeah, there are a number of reasons the book's got to be clean. One, it makes the returns cheaper and easier and more accurate. It makes a big difference in what we charge to do a return if you've got a clean set of books. Two, if you ever get audited, having a clean set of books makes all the difference. Yeah. All the difference. We have seen so many people who are entitled to deductions, but they wouldn't do what it took to back them up, which is mostly bookkeeping. Also, it makes the audit go a lot faster. And when you're paying somebody on the clock to represent you, that makes a difference. Sure. Um, I'd say the number one reason, well, let, me, let me get one more, then I'll give you number one. One more reason to have a good set of books, entity maintenance. You know, entities are cheap and easy to create. I always joke that an entity is like a child. The process of creating one is fun and easy. <laughs> Maintaining it. Generally cheap, too. Effort. Generally, generally yeah. cheap. It depends on. <laughs> as long as, yeah, you're not in California or Illinois or some, some silly state. Um, they're easy to make, but maintaining the entities takes effort and time. And part of that maintenance is a good set of books. But the number one reason to have a good set of books, here's why they call them the books. It tells the story of your business. Yeah. And if you don't know the story of your business, like people guess, oh, I think I made money on this deal. And then they look later and it turns out they didn't or they didn't make as much as they thought. But they kept doing the same type of deal because they thought they made money. Oops. So that's the number one reason. It tells the story of your business. Absolutely. It's not that hard to do, and I think you can farm it out at an early threshold. In other words, what most of the people listening to this call are good at is making deals, buying and selling houses. A lot of them are either not good at bookkeeping or they are good at it, but they don't want to be. Right. I would say once your time is worth more than 20 bucks an hour, it's time to farm that out. What we do now, we don't like to do bookkeeping in our office because we think it can be done very cheaply and we don't like doing things cheap. I don't like billing 20 bucks an hour. That makes me very sad. Yeah. But what we can do is find local bookkeepers. Um, my, my favorite are maybe a stay-at-home mom or somebody who's retired, but someone who has experience and wants flexibility and in exchange, they maybe aren't going to charge you 50 bucks an hour. Those are the best. Sometimes you have to train them. Um, we do a lot of that work. We'll consult with investors that are farming out their bookkeeping. We explain to the bookkeeper, which is a lot easier than explaining it to the investor, how to do things. And then we might look at their books every month, every quarter, something like that. And then once it's clear that they get it, we might only look during planning season, which is about now starting to come up on the latter half of the year where we start sure. to do planning. We'll see the books, and if there are issues, that's when we'll pick them up. And we also do teach people how to do their own books. Um, so there, there are some options out there for that. Uh, we, we found that we had so many bookkeeping issues and questions, we just finally wrote a home study course that we sell. And, and okay. that gets people out of the way. But I don't want to be – you said don't be pushy, so I'm not going to be pushy. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll add a link to it. I think it's a great – I mean, in all honesty, like you said, a lot of – most of the real estate investors I know – are not good at bookkeeping and they have, it's just a necessary evil. But I mean, this is such a cash intensive business that you've got to know where you stand at any given time. I mean, you're going to, you're going to wind up in trouble if you don't. And especially in the world that we're living in, we live in a different world than 10 years ago, certainly different than 20 years ago. The world, like it or not, is getting more bureaucratic, more socialized. The government and the regulators are sticking their nose in more and demanding more. And like it or not, you're going to spend more of your time, instead of producing wealth, tracking the wealth. And I don't like it, and I'll try and minimize it, but it is the reality. And if you run things like a cowboy, I've seen it, where you didn't really do anything wrong, but it allows an IRS agent or some other regulator to nail you, even though you didn't really do anything wrong. So unfortunately, you really do have to track what you do. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, having been through an audit myself, it's no fun. But I can tell you, my wife is extremely organized. I mean, our when they wanted something, it's like boom, here you go, and we just had it. And you got to you got to believe that that makes a difference versus yeah. saying, I don't know, I don't have the information you're asking for. It's going to take me four months to get it, or here's a box of receipts, or whatever. You've got. I mean, at the end of the day. These are IRS auditors are people too, and if they see that that you're buttoned up, they'll probably be more. Uh, you would expect an auditor to be more respectful of that. They're like, wow, they've got, you know, if they're this organized, things are probably better than we thought. You know, maybe I don't know. those audits tend to get dropped sooner. They tend to have a better result, and yeah. and either one of those things is a good thing. If you have to get audited, even if it doesn't go well, shorter is better. And if you've sure. got some good books. <laughs> it's likely to go better. And we have had auditors, what we've done before, for example, because in audits, I'm very proactive and ask questions and push things. I get away with stuff that really isn't part of the law. It's just what the agent would allow. Well, that's a whole different thing. If you ask questions, a good example would be, all right, my client has 100 rentals. They wanted to see a profit and loss for each one. And I said, hey, yeah, that's a lot of work. Come on, let's do 20. And to make sure that we're not pulling the wool over your eyes, you pick which 20. And if you want to see more properties after the first 20, we'll show them to you. But let's just start with a sample. I'll tell you what, when you put it that way, 9 out of 10 IRS auditors will take that approach. And if the 20 look good, they're not going to look any further. They, right. got, they got quotas. Right. You've heard the story about the guy and, the, and his buddy and the bear in the woods. And the bear comes after the guy and the guy puts on his tennis shoes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the answer is, buddy says, why are you putting on tennis shoes? You cannot run a bear. And he says, I don't have to run the bear. I got to run you. Right, right. The same thing with the IRS, right? If you're, if you're <laughs> the hard case, the auditor is going to go look for something else most of the time. Right, right. Absolutely. Awesome. So good information. So yeah, we'll, we'll add a link. I know you've got a home study course for people that want to maybe buy it for themselves or even train their bookkeeper. So that's great. We, we, you know, we went through that process where we had to teach our bookkeeper, somebody that, you know, had no experience in real estate. We had to teach them. But once that was set, it's pretty much on autopilot now for the most part and it makes your life a lot. You can focus on what you enjoy doing and what makes you the most money. You got it. And do, it's not bookkeeping. <laughs> yeah, do what you're good at and do what you like. And and for all that I'm a tax guy and a lawyer and an accountant, I don't like doing bookkeeping either. I know how to yeah. do it, how to teach it. I would rather drink probably gasoline mixed in with ground glass than do my own. <laughs> don't do that, man. All right. Um, so let's move on to the next topic we're talking about. I know you do a lot of work with IRAs and, um, you know, there's some people that that's all they do. Some real estate investors, I know that's all they do. They swear by it. There's some that don't do any of it like me. In fact, I, I do none of it, but I'm very intrigued by it and I don't know why I'm not doing it. I just am so busy that I can't change gears at this point, but that'll change soon. But let's talk about kind of building wealth with IRAs. Let's, and let's include in that everything I say about IRAs more or less applies to 401ks. HSAs, also known as health savings accounts, and CESAs, Coverdale Educational Savings Accounts. So everything I say about an IRA, you can take and do, put your kid through private school. And I don't mean just college. I mean private school. If you can get enough money in a CESA, you can do it tax-free. My health care, I just went a few months ago to South America to get my health care done. Um, the, den the dentist up here wanted four grand. I got it done down there for about a grand by an American-trained doctor. It was great service, paid for the trip twice over, and I was able to pay for it out of my health savings account. I showed up with a debit card, presented the debit card, boom, done. Wow. So, Where, oh, sorry, say that again. Where did you go? I went. My wife's from Chile in South okay. America. Awesome. Um, and I grew up speaking Spanish, so I have no trouble getting along. So I needed some dental work done. Well, I just went down there and, and got the work done. Yeah. I paid for it out of my HSA. I've gotten minor surgery, like sinus surgeries done down there. You get better service. Don't even get me started because the healthcare system in this country is so messed up. It's not right. even funny. If you know which doctors to use overseas, you don't just use a random one. Right. It's, it's a great relationship. You give them little green pieces of paper and they give you advice. It's wonderful. Yeah, None of the yeah. lawyers or government. But I digress. What can you do with an IRA? First of all, you can do flips in an IRA. I'm not a big fan. i got to say, and if we have time, we'll talk about it. I'm not a big fan of assignments in IRAs. And let me just give you the, the, if you do what's called a prohibited transaction in an IRA, and this is 70% of my IRA discussions are how to avoid a prohibited transaction. Yep. Prohibited transaction with a capital P and a capital T are bad. If you do one prohibited transaction, even a tiny one, if you do a $10 prohibited transaction in your million dollar IRA, it dissolves your IRA. All the money comes out and gets taxed. 
you pay penalties. We tell people if you do a, a prohibited transaction in your IRA, you should count on paying 50 to 60 percent to the government. Hmm. So we want to avoid that at all costs. Frankly, we're a little bit conservative on that because the penalty is so high. Well, yeah. So on regular taxes, we're very aggressive. The penalty for being wrong on regular taxes is much, much lower. So it's okay to be aggressive and, and, and play the gray in the law. But with IRAs, we're careful. With that said, what can you do in your IRA? Rentals, easily. I know a guy, he's 60 years old. He's got 50 free and clear rentals in his IRA. Think about that. Wow. It's, a, it's a Roth IRA. He pays no tax on the money he pulls out of it because he's 60 and he's had it for more than five years. He has got 50 plus free and clear rentals that he's not paying any tax on. That's wealth building. Yeah, so, hey, now, John, so one of the challenges right? with, with, an, with an IRA is, is getting a whole lot of money in there. I mean, you're restricted by how much you can put in. Talk about how people will kind of build up that amount of wealth. Is it from doing other real estate transactions inside of there and building it up? or how? Because a lot of folks that you know, are listening now, right. even if you've been maxing it out for 10 years, you may not have enough to even buy one house yet. Here's one example, and, and we don't have the time to go into hyper detail, but I like simple. All things being equal, if simple works better than complex, you do simple. Outcomes razor. Here's one example, very simple. You can borrow in your IRA. Now, there are some rules you have to follow in terms of how the debt is structured and who the lender can be. That's where I get involved. We structure that. But your IRA can borrow, right? The way this gentleman I'm talking about got 50 free and clear rentals in his Roth, he put five grand a year in his Roth, just like you and me. Not a lot. He never touched that money. That was his reserve on the side. He would go buy 100% leveraged property using private money, which you flipper guys are already familiar with private money. Yep. Now, he negotiated some pretty good rates. He didn't tend to pay hard money rates. He went after more like 6 to 8% private stuff. And he paid the rentals quickly. The, the key was is he amortized the loans quickly. Why is that important? Because in an IRA, if you borrow, you pay tax to the extent you borrowed. For example, let's say I buy a property for 100 grand. My IRA puts down 10 and borrows 90. We look at the rental income at the end of the year. 90% of the rental income is taxable. So you pay a tax, it's called UBIT, U-B-I-T, Unrelated Business Income Tax, in English just IRA tax. But what you do is if you pay the loan down fast, every year that percentage drops really fast. So the amount of tax you're paying drops really fast until it's free and clear. Well, this guy amortized those things over four years. Hmm. Now here's the beauty. It's simple. Even the IRS gets debt. And there's a psychological advantage. IRS auditors, because unlike most people, I've been in IRS audits with IRAs and I've been in the tax court and done quite well. IRS auditors hate Roths. It just bothers them that you're not paying any tax. It really bugs them. If you pay a little bit of UBIT over the years, maybe those four years where you're amortizing the property, you paid a little bit of tax every year, you would not believe the difference that makes in their attitudes. It's purely psychological. Purely psychological. They're like, you paid something. It wasn't a lot, but you paid something. So it's a great way to balloon it. So how do you how do you put a kid through private school? All right, maybe you you borrow the same way you guys do with private money. You do some flips in your IRA. Now maybe there's if you're borrowing, there's going to be some tax paid. So on the first few deals, you pay tax. But once you got this big chunk in your IRA, enough that it can fund its own flips, now it does a periodic flip and doesn't pay tax. Now I say periodic. If you do too many too many flips. In an IRA, it becomes taxable, separate issue. But if you do one or two flips a year, maybe three flips a year, once the IRA's got its own money that it got from the leverage on the earlier flips, you could do that in the Coverdale Educational Savings Account and pay your kid's private school when he's three years old. You could do that in your health savings account and have a big nut for health care costs as you need them. And in the yes. meantime, it's growing tax-free. You could so do the, ed the, the education account you mentioned, is that a, that's a separate vehicle from an IRA? It's a separate vehicle, but it follows the same rules. And I get the same complaint that you kind of alluded to. People say, look, we can only put $2,000 a year in there. and eh, it's not worth it. Well, you think and you structure how to do it. You can turn that 2000 just like the guy I was telling you about. You don't touch the 2000 You put it to the side. It's a reserve. You borrow the money you need for the deal. You guys are already used to doing that. Mm-hmm. You do the deal, and like I said, on the first few, since you borrowed, you eat the tax. But at some point, that cease is going to have a nice, rich balance in it. 
Or you do the rentals instead of the flips. You borrow on those and yeah. you just pay the debt down fast. So you don't pay a lot of tax. Eventually it's tax free and the cash flow pays for your child's education. Yeah. So I just want people to understand. You can tell I'm into it. I'm really into yeah. it. I don't like what the government does with your money. Most of what they do with it, let's not even get me started because you'll have right. to bleep me and it'd be horrible. <laughs> But if we can use their own rules legally and creatively to get around it, to pay your kids' tuition, to pay their private school, to pay all your health care, and bear in mind some of the stuff that's health care, I mean, I'm sure we've all heard of the case where if the doctor prescribes a swimming pool for whatever condition you got, it's tax deductible and can be run through an HSA. That's true. Hmm. That's not even gray law. It's black letter law. Yeah. So there are things we can do. Add to it then, building up your retirement because, I mean, nobody who's rational is counting on Social Security. Right. right. I think Lindsay Lohan will invent, quant she'll, she'll invent cold fusion before you and I see any significant <laughs> Social Security money. Right, right. Um, so just some thoughts, and I'm throwing them out machine gun as fast as I can, hopefully yeah. they're understandable to people, of some of the things you can do. Now, why don't you hear about this? There are very few people who know about IRAs in the tax world, and the reason is, there's been very little until recently IRS activity in terms of auditing and going after it. So there's been no money in learning it, and it's been a pretty obscure area. I got lucky in that somebody years ago brought an audit to me that we did really well with on an IRA. I did my homework, and so now I start getting more of that whenever someone has issues. And as a consequence, I'm well-equipped to plan. Um, let me give you one more piece of advice on the IRAs, because a lot of people use what's called a checkbook LLC. It's an LLC that your IRA owns 100% of. Hmm. There are, just like anything else, there are ways to do that correctly, and there are ways to do that incorrectly. What I'm seeing is most of the checkbook LLC documents we review in our office are templates. There is no training of the investor how to run it, and they get themselves in trouble quick. In fact, the IRS is now focused on it because they figured this out. I'll give you an example. You should not manage your own IRA LLC. If your, L if your IRA owns an LLC, you shouldn't manage it. Why? IRS says, and the code says, you're not allowed to provide a service. Well, is managing an LLC a service? Well, we, we don't know. There's no definition in the code. So someday a court's going to tell us if it is or it isn't. My guess is they're going to say it is. Yeah. So you want someone else to manage it. Now, you still tell them what to do, and there are procedures and ways to do that. So Exciting stuff, a lot of opportunities, a lot of ways when you're starting to make real wealth and you're, you're just sick and tired of paying 45 to 50% to the government, start running your business. I got clients that that's what they do. They make this much a year, let's say, you know, 200 grand in the Midwest, which in the Midwest, 200 grand, live like a king. Mm -hmm. Everything else gets run through the IRA or the HSA or the CSA. I got clients who structure their lives that way because they refuse to pay 40% plus tax rates. Yeah. So just some thoughts. You got to interrupt. Me, right? Keep going. No, that's great, man. We're 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 kind of winding down on time here. We're, uh, but that's a lot of information packed into one show. I definitely appreciate that. For folks that want to learn more, John, um, and I know a number of folks that, that have recommended you in the past. So I know you do great work. If people are interested in, in learning more about some of the services you provide, who should they contact? Where should they go? I would give them two places: um, realestatetaxlaw.com realestatetaxlaw.com and just fair warning I'm so busy the websites horribly obsolete it gives you an idea there are some articles but if the website looks like it hasn't been updated in six years it's because it hasn't so, <laughs> all right just telling you and then the other one is you can just call the office um, 800-762-3290 that's 800-762-3290 three two nine oh and our clients are from all over the country and increasingly from out of the country I'm sure you've seen it in your business that there's a lot more buyers from overseas absolutely we're getting a lot of buyers especially from the Anglosphere and from Southeast Asia uh, buying buy and hold properties uh, for the cash flow and the currency advantages that they have right now so we're seeing a lot of that as well so bottom line is we can do this virtually yeah yeah absolutely absolutely well, John, hey, thanks for sharing all that great information. I know, I know it was a ton to pack into just a little over a half hour here, but great stuff for sure. Maybe we'll have to have you back on and take some deep dives into some of these topics. You want to have some fun, tell people what are their questions 
get me a list of questions of a week or two before a show, and we'll answer them one at a time. It'll be fun. There we go. There we go. Awesome. Awesome. Well, well John, hey, thanks so much for joining us today. Appreciate it. Pleasure. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Are you a member of Flipner.com, the most robust real estate investing platform in existence, where you can find off-market wholesale deals and great vendors literally in your market? You can get access to advice from experts and learn about local clubs and events right in your backyard. If not, please visit Flipner.com and register for a free account. You can register in less than a minute. It's pretty much the coolest site that's ever existed in the real estate investing industry. So get on over to Flipner.com.